trying to adjust this this morning, I ended up with one to, uh, Richard Carroll is not normal, or not natural. <laughs> <laughs> one to one teaching is not natural, when you think about it. You have a conversation for up to six hours, seven hours, with a total stranger, and you're expected to talk. You're expected to come in and just dictate a conversation, make it flow, everything will be fine. Um, the only stranger before I did this, uh, that I talked to for four hours was, was someone on a plane coming back from the Canaries <laughs> with four or five gin and tonics. <laughs> <laughs> on a Monday morning coming in, someone you haven't met before, it's a, a different ballgame. Um, my first experience of one-to-one -one was in Berlitz. It was my first job a couple of years ago in Dublin. I've been working there for about a month with uh, classes and then the boss, this hasn't been filmed, is it? It has been filmed. <laughs> Frank, say quick. Frank comes into the story a couple of times. Um, best way to describe Frank. There's a very good documentary about the Eagles. You know the band. Mm -hmm. I'm not particularly fan of the Eagles, but the documentary is very good. And at one point, Joe Walsh joins, and one of the other members of the band said, "I was delighted when Joe joined. He's an interesting bunch of guys." <laughs> <laughs> that was Frank. Kind of eccentric, very bright, very good teacher, very good DOS. But he said to me after a month, would you like to try one-to-one? -one? I said, yeah, sure. Okay, we have this Russian lady. Um, you'll have her for two weeks. Her husband is here already. We suspect he's an oligarch. He's very, very wealthy. He's very difficult. He studies in the morning, or he's been taught in the morning. You'll have this woman in the afternoon. They have a five-month-old child, and they're switching roles. So I said, that's fine. So, she was due to start at 2 o'clock. Berlitz is a three or four story building. It's, I was up in the very top room, there's a kind of a windy staircase up into the attic. I'm waiting there. 2 o'clock, nothing. 5 past 2, no sign of her. 10 past 2, nothing. It's just about to investigate when I heard a clumping sound coming up the stairs. And the room's quite small, I'm sitting at the back. The door's kicked open, kicked open. And I saw this big long boot, leather boot. Uh, three or four brown Thomas bags are dumped in the corner. <laughs> There's a pause, then another couple of brown Thomas bags. Then she st stuck her head around, um, very, very beautiful woman, long dark hair, and I was just about to introduce myself, and she says, Can I get coffee? And I said, Yeah, there's a, there's a kitchen next door, I'll get it for you. I'm not disabled, she says and goes into the kitchen. Oh, this is just great. A little bit of background to that. I had been to the dental hospital that day. My front tooth had fallen out, my crown. I was in a bit of pain. I wasn't happy. After about 10 minutes and a couple of phone calls, she comes back in. I introduce myself. She sits down somewhat reluctantly in front of me. Um, I'm Richard. I'm Julia. You can call me Julia. And I start to speak. I start to say, well, that's, you know, I've asked you a few questions. We get to know each other. And she puts her hand up and says, I don't want to be here. My husband wants me to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't think I need any lessons. And then something in my head just went snap, like a little chicken bone. I can still hear the noise. <laughs> and I said, you know what? Neither do I. And I closed, closed my book, put the pen into my bag and stuff. So I think I'm going to go for a pint. And I said, that's it. Career over, job over, everything over. And then she said, what's a pint? I said, it's a unit of measurement, normally beer, but I think it might be wine in about ten <laughs> She said, I like wine. I said, do you want to come? And this was just for me to get out of the room. Do you want to come? And she said, yes. Fifteen minutes later, in the pub down the road, getting on like a house on the fire. Absolutely fine. No problem whatsoever. It was all a big misunderstanding. Did I handle it well? Of course not. It was very <laughs> I was very lucky. Turned out she was really, really bright, very intelligent, very well read wanted to talk about literature, but wasn't quite sure how to do it. She knew all about Russian literature, she wanted to find out more about uh, Irish literature, English literature, and so on, and various other interests that she had. It was a joy. Two weeks, I didn't need to plan a thing. I would just turn up, and we'd start to talk. She set the agenda. It was very, very easy. After the two weeks, Frank said to me, how was that? Oh, this is great. Frank, it was fantastic. I love one-to-one. -one. <laughs> I'm very good at it. <laughs> Because she talked the whole time and she learned a lot, she was very happy. He said, would you, would you do another one in a couple of weeks? Yeah, sure, okay. Um, so he said, this guy's uh, from Brazil, he's uh, Japanese parents, he's here to learn English. Okay, that's fine. Um, 
He's waiting for me the week later. I go into Frank's office just before meeting this guy for the first time, and I said, Frank, what's his level? He doesn't have a level. Okay. I thought Frank was joking, he wasn't. I went and said, how are you? And the guy just looked at me. <laughs> he had nothing. He had absolutely nothing. Hello, goodbye, weather, how do I go here, how do I go? Nothing whatsoever. So I panicked for a bit. But then, it was, of course, I had a blank sheet. It was very, very easy. I used the picture dictionary. We talked about uh, how to buy a cup of tea, how to get a bus ticket. After a while, I had him making, making phone calls, ordering stuff. And it was nice to see him progress because it was just from, literally from the ground. And when he, when he got something, he was a nice kid, he was about 22, um, he tried very hard. And when something went into his head, he'd go, ah, oh, ah, oh, yeah, and I think, fantastic. Eventually, I got him to negotiate. It was coming up to Christmas. I said, I want to buy a diary for my father. I'm going to get the best price in this shop. And he actually asked for it. And what they said to him, I have no idea. I was outside. Uh, pretending not to know, but he came out <laughs> and he got a couple of euro off this 15 euro diary. Very easy. Again, no planning. I didn't have to do anything. I had just had to think about something that might be useful for him. Absolutely easy. A couple of others that followed were fairly easy as well. There was uh, an Italian guy from, uh, it's an Italian guy from Italy, uh, Italian guy from Luigi, who just, he was setting up a tourist business. So that was his entire area. It was all about tourism. He wanted to look at hotels, restaurants, that kind of thing. Nice and easy. There was another Italian guy from Google. Anyone ever taught in Google? It's in the Google building. It's a very strange place. Right? Very strange place. Um, they have sort of their own language. Um, <laughs> it was difficult as well because I was going into his environment rather than him coming to me, which is a point uh, worth mentioning. But he was, how should I say, very, very Italian, very stressed. Everything was a great stress. And uh, I went in with a plan, but he was not interested in the plan whatsoever. He wanted his emails to be corrected. So I started doing that, and I noticed that uh, one of the emails said, he was quite high up, and he had to address some English customer, and he said, I'm very, well, I'm happy to tell you that the delivery date will now be March instead of February. And I said, what are you saying you're happy to, to tell them? I mean, you're giving bad news. He said, well, in Italy, that's what we say. I say, and are you in Italy now, Alessandra? No, I'm not. And he said, I've been doing that wrong the whole time. Yeah. Then he just got me to do his emails. Every time I went in, that's pretty much what I did. I corrected what he had written. Um, they have a strange expression as well, too, uh, organized meeting in Google. They say they reach out. They reach out to you. Said that to me after the first class. I'll reach out to you next time. <laughs> <laughs> sounded like a carpenter song or something. So you'd be very lonely here. Um, normally you say contact, contact somebody. Um, but that was just their language. We had a kind of a few discussions about that. Again, nice and easy. It was, it, there was no problem. It was an hour and a half, not too long. The agenda had been set. And I came away looking. <laughs> That's fantastic. You do a good job. They've learned a bit, maybe an expression they weren't sure of, or a word they've misheard, a bit of grammar they were had problems with, and it's fixed, and you're getting on with them. That's the thing, you're getting on with them. It's an unnatural thing, one to one, but if you get on with them, it's easy. Okay? That doesn't happen all the time. Unfortunately, sometimes it's the way I might be feeling going into. Um, a class, particularly one. Um, <laughs> there was this business guy, and it was for a week. And God was on it. I've kind of suppressed most of the memory. <laughs> I won't say where he was from. His name was Fritz, um, and he was uh, yeah, sorry. He was in charge of a big part of a bigger company, and he knew it all. He absolutely knew it all. So I went went in thinking we'd have was all day with him. A um, bit of social English, what's your hobbies, what's your interests? And he sort of reluctantly asked to answer the questions. Then at lunchtime he went off and made a complaint. He said, this is trivial, the class is trivial. I've been asked about what movie I like, or what play I saw recently, or what I like to watch on TV, or about my city, or whatever. Frank said, he just wants grammar, and that's what he got. <laughs> From that afternoon, for the next five days, he got grammar. He got exercises, he got exam papers, you name it, he got it. Writing. 
listening, everything. Quite a tough day. But in terms of planning, not that bad. I didn't have to worry about establishing a relationship with them. If you establish a relationship with your one-to-one, -one, it makes it easy. It makes it so much easier. But it's unnatural and it's, it's difficult. But one extreme to the other, it's handleable. With this guy, it was back to the self debate. Remember that? We had a lesson plan, three minutes on this, two minutes on that. Everything was organized down to the <coughs> It wasn't easy, it wasn't flowing. Um, but I survived it somehow. The difficulty is with the ones in between, people in between, where you have them for a certain amount of time, and it's not that you're not getting on with them, but like any conversation you would have with someone you don't know very well, there are purple patches and there are patches when it gets a little bit dull. So the main thing I found is just to find out as much as you can about them, so you've got something to talk about. Obviously, a large part of the class will be dedicated to improving what they need to improve, and that's fine. That's just like an ordinary lesson. But it's the bits in between. You're there for a long time. You can't have a gap. And Peter talked about silence being important. It is important, but with just the one person in a room, it's, it's very difficult unless they're doing something specific. So rather than when you're trying to find out about them, rather than try and, trying to get it all in the one go, that's the temptation um, I fell prey to. I'd meet them for the first time, I'd spend an hour, what do you like, all of that. People don't like it after a while, they don't, particularly adults you're dealing with, they don't like to be quizzed so much, what they may regard as personal stuff, and there's a cultural element to that as well. So I would do a little, I would do a little for that day, so that if we're going for a coffee or we're in between classes, I have something that I know they're interested in, but I'm not being exhaustive about it, little bits. What I tend to do as well is write all the time. I made that mistake at the beginning of just when something occurred to me, I would make, I would write it down. And it's sort of distracting. I didn't realize how distracting it is for another person. In a class, you don't notice. But if it's just you and someone else, um, they feel that they made a mistake. And in fact, we had a, a, a girl here, a young learner, and I'll talk about young learners later, um, if I don't want to have time. Um, I started to do this, and she said, she was a really good speaker, but she says, oh, I feel really uncomfortable. I think you're writing down my mistakes. Because I left it too long. If I started doing it from the, from the top, just in nonchalantly doodling, writing things down, mm -hmm. things I need, might need to check, or maybe it's a mistake that they made. Um, on that note as well, when do you correct them? When do you correct them? It depends. It really depends. If they're making a huge error to begin with, I'd nail that. Okay, but if they're trying to, if they're not terribly comfortable speaking, and they're trying to explain some news item or something like that, and they make a few mistakes, I leave it. Leave it till after, maybe even till the end of the day. But you have to keep note. And then they like that. This is that kind of trust thing that you've been listening to me, that you've corrected me, that's fine. Um, I'm teaching a, 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 I was teaching a doctor here um, for our IELTS, I love her. Really bright girl. But she kept saying, besides of this, it was her favorite expression. I think she has a dog or got a pillow or something in her head. <laughs> so I have to keep saying, no, you can't say that, why not? Because it doesn't mean anything. That's why you can't say it. Where is she from? Uh, she's Chinese, but from Malaysia. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, there could be something obvious. Uh, her partner, who was also a doctor, his issue was pronunciation. And then he had to do the IELTS, so I have to kind of keep making him repeat the thing. Which is a bit dull, but you just have to do it sometimes. As long as they know why you're doing it. Um, and that you're listening. Now that's the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you make a mistake? When they make plenty of mistakes. Um, or if they ask you a different, quite a difficult question. You know you got a horrible question. When shall I use the, the future perfect continuous in your book? There's nowhere to hide. In a class you can say something else you can get away. I developed a technique. I think I just panicked one day. Um, it was, might have been, I don't remember who it was, but someone asked me a difficult question. I knew the answer, but it wasn't on the top of my head. So I happened to be at the door, and the question was just asked. <laughs> and I said, oh, hang on, I think that's Frank. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> out the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came back. I was actually pretending to talk. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, okay. I have to go back to class. Oh, what's the question? Yes, yes. It's <laughs> 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 Always have the internet on your phone. <laughs> don't, rely, don't rely on the 
Wi-Fi gets the same supply to the building, have your own supply. Uh, the other thing is, and this sounds very obvious, that's what I heard one day. I just drifted with wave the ferries. What happens is all same person for hours and hours, and they say something, and you've just been thinking just momentarily about what you're going to have for dinner or anything like that. And I realised this person had asked me a question, and I absolutely know I do that. And I think I said something like, "We're, we're doing that tomorrow." No problem. But pay attention. You have to pay attention. It can be quite difficult. In terms of helping you do that, in Dublin it was easy because I could take people out. If they didn't want to go out, I took them out anyway. <laughs> we went for a coffee. We're going to go to the museum. We're going to go this, that, and the other. Um, walking around the room, just keeping yourself alert. The laptop is great. How many for time picture? I'm sorry, I've lost track. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, resources. Um, YouTube and my favourite BBC Radio 4. BBC Radio 4 is fantastic. The amount of surprise looks I get on saying you can type in anything on the iPlayer. It's for the radio. It's more for TV, but it works on the radio. But any topic in the world, you can set it for homework. Something that they're interested in, if, they're, if it's their business or their hobby, listen to that tonight. Now you have to listen to it as well. That's the other sort of thing. And you come in the next day and it's set up. Just to finish on this example, was the, the writer Roald Dahl. Um, he wrote in his garden, um, but before he finished, he would have the item for the next day, his next idea, so he came out. And I found that quite useful as well, when you're finishing at the end of the one to one, in the morning we're doing this, and then do it. And then anything you have to check, make sure that you've checked, and it's all about the trusting. Okay, thank you. Thank you.